In this final video for the week, we're going to look at one more example of bootstrapping. This time we're going to look at apartments in Edinburgh. So take a guess, how much does a typical three bedroom flat in Edinburgh rent for? I'll wait for a second. Here's data that I uh, scraped from uh, rightmove.co.uk and we have data on, let's see, 15 flats from um, Edinburgh. And these are all three bedroom uh, flats or apartments, whatever you call them. And we have um, an ID for them, their rent information, the title for the, um, for the uh, listing on rightmove.co.uk and then the address as well. This is what the distribution of the rents looks like. So we can see that we, the center of this seems to be somewhere close to 2,000 pounds. So actually it's 1895. And here are actually the pictures from these flats that are available for rent. So we can see that um, we have um, you know, flats that are ranging from 825 pounds to, let's see, what's the most expensive one here? 24, oh, 3,250, for example. And this is what they look like. Well, if this is our observed sample and 1895 is our observed sample mean, what does our bootstrap population look like? We're basically assuming that there probably are more flats like the ones in our observed sample in the population as well. So here everything is really tiny, but basically what I've done is I've repeated those observations. Similar to saying, I'm putting these 15 flats in a bag and assuming there are many more like the ones in there in that bag. That's my bootstrap population. It's not a real population because I don't have data on the real population. If I had it, we would not be having this video. We would not be talking about things at all. I would simply take the mean of all of the observations. The thing is, I don't have data from the full population, so I have to just work with these 15 flats. So our bootstrapping scheme to review is we take a bootstrap sample, which is a random sample taken with replacement from the original sample of the same size as the original sample. In this case, that'll be 15. We then calculate the bootstrap statistic. We're interested in the mean uh, uh, rent right now, so we're going to stick with that. We repeat these steps many, many times to calculate many bootstrap means. And then finally, we can make a histogram of those and take the middle, let's say 95% of them to build our confidence interval. So how do we do this with tidy models? So in this case, we're not working on a regression problem. We're basically working on, we have data from a single sample and we're trying to build a confidence interval around the mean. Um, there's a, uh, in the tidy models, we can start by, with our data frame. So that's the Eddie uh, underscore three BR. That was the data frame that we read in. We specify our response variable. That's the rent column. Then we generate replicates. So I, uh, we said 15,000 might be a good number of a uh, number of samples. So we generate 15,000 bootstrap samples. So that's, it's like reaching into the bag, make, grabbing a random sample of 15 flats with replacement. That's my one. And then doing that same thing 15,000 times uh, to generate these samples. And then we calculate the mean of each one of them. So I'm not actually interested in the, uh, the values in each of these samples, but I am interested in the means of each of these samples. And then finally, I'm going to save that uh, value. So now I am, end up with 15,000 means. Those 15,000 means, each of them represent a mean of a bootstrap sample. Each of these values are no longer individual flats, but they are means of 15 flats. And we're going to look to see how much do they vary from one to another so that we can uh, quantify our uncertainty around how much the sample means vary. Um, so here is a distribution of those 15,000 means. Um, and we can see that the center is going to be right around the center for our, um, uh, right around our sample mean, which was 1895. Everything is distributed around that original sample. So if your original sample was not good, none of this is worthwhile because everything now is centered around uh, your original sample. All right, Dorian. There we go. 
So how do we calculate the confidence interval? Well, I have the sample. What I can do is I can say, give me the middle 95%. So for that, I would be saying, uh, I wanna chop off 2.5% from the bottom end and 2.5% from the upper end. So I can calculate the quantiles of my um, uh, distribution of these statistics, one at the 2.5% mark and the other one at the 97.5% mark because we're looking at the middle 95%. So here are the numbers 1603 and 2213. Uh, so you can imagine that those are the vertical lines that would be chopping off the top and bottom 2.5% of this distribution. And here is what they look like here in this visualization. How do we interpret these numbers? So let's think a little bit about this interpretation. So the 95% confidence interval for the mean rent of three bedroom flats in Edinburgh was calculated as 1603 to 2213. Which of the following is the correct interpretation of this interval? I'll give you a second to take a look at them. And let's go through them one by one. So A says 95% of the time, mean rent of three bedroom flats in the sample is between 1603 and 2213. Uh, is that right? It sounds like there is a true mean rent that's like moving around in, and then sometimes it's in between these values and sometimes it's not. Really that unknown population parameter, we don't know it, but it's not moving around. It's a fixed value. So this notion of 95% of the time something is happening is not correct. Let's look at the next interpretation. 95% of all three bedroom flats in Edinburgh have rents between 1603 and 2213. This is saying something about individual flats as opposed to saying something about the average, the population average. We're not after prediction of individual uh, flat rents, right? That would be a different exercise and one we would need explanatory variables for. Right now, we're trying to estimate the true population mean, and this statement is not about the true population mean. C says we're 95% confident that the mean rent of all three bedroom flats is between 1603 and 2213, and bingo, that is in fact the right interpretation. It tells us something about our confidence level as opposed to uh, kind of uh, prediction uh, accuracy or something like that. And it is about the mean rent of all three bedroom flats, because that's what we're building an interval for. And finally, the last one says we're 95% confident that the mean rent of three bedroom flats in the sample is between 1603 and 2213. If you were to look at the difference between C and D, the difference is in this sample versus all, right? Um, which one is correct? Well, the correct one is C and not D because we already know what's in the sample. I don't need to build a confidence interval for the sample. I already have the data. And in fact, the mean of that sample is in that interval. I should be 100% confident of it because I built the whole interval around that mean anyway. So D, is it's correct that this sample's mean is between these two values. That is correct. But um, that we don't have any uncertainty around that number anyway. So to say that 95, we're only 95% confident is inaccurate. And also this is not at all an interesting statement because we're not doing inference for the sample. We're doing inference for the unknown population. Now let's talk a little bit about accuracy versus precision of these intervals that we're reporting. So we said we're 95% confident that. What did we mean by that? I mean, imagine you were to ask a friend, well, in a different time, imagine you were to ask a friend, do you wanna go see a movie this weekend? And they said, oh, I'm 95% confident that I'd like to. You'd be like, you know what? I'm never inviting you to another movie again. That's a ridiculous statement to make. But when we say we're 95% confident, in this context, we actually mean something very, very precise, right? 
in the other example, your friend was basically saying, yeah, probably I'll come, but I don't want to commit to it. That's not what we mean here. What we mean here is that suppose we took many samples from the original population and built 90, a 95% confidence interval based on each sample. So that would, you know, different samples from the original population, slightly different confidence intervals based on each one of them then about 95% of those intervals would contain the true population parameter. That's what that 95% statement is about. Some commonly used confidence levels are these. So um, we have, we usually use like a 90 and 95 and a 99% confidence interval. So let's take a look at these. Which one of these do we think belongs to the 90 versus the 95 versus the 99? So remember that in the previous slide, we said that our confidence level is about what percent of these intervals would contain the true population parameter. If we want more of them to contain the true population parameter, we should be reaching out further. And reaching out further would mean that we are expanding our confidence interval. So the widest interval has the one with the highest confidence level. So in this case, that would be 95, I'm uh, sorry, 99. The blue dashed line is our 95% confidence interval. And the narrower one is 90. The narrower the intervals are, the, low, sorry, the lower your confidence level, the narrower your intervals. So, you might be thinking, then wouldn't we always want the higher confidence level if that means that we're uh, more likely to capture the population mean? Well, if we want to be very certain that we capture the population parameter, should we use a wider or narrower interval? Wider, right? That's what we saw with that orange one. But what drawbacks are associated with using a wider interval? Let's take a look at this silly comic here from Garfield. So the it says, uh, the TV says, taking a look at tomorrow's weather, the high temperature will be between 40 below zero and 200 above. And Garfield says, the sky's never wrong. The guy is probably never wrong. I could tell you, you're going to get, a, you know, a score between zero and 100 in this class. I am very confident of it. I'm right, but am I being helpful? No. Um, in this case, the interval is so wide that it's not actually helpful. So how do we get the best of worth worlds, both high precision and high accuracy? Really what we would need for that is a larger sample size. That's assuming you have good quality sample to begin with, If you have more data, you're going to be able to uh, provide uh, your estimates with higher precision and higher accuracy. It sounds like an easy statement to make, but not necessarily an easy statement to put into practice because getting uh, more data is not always trivial. So in the, um, in the context that we were working with in terms of the code, how do we change our confidence level between these 90 and 99%? So if we take a look at the code, where how we build our bootstrap interval, so that's up to here, uh, where we specify our, our response variable, generate bootstrap samples, and what we calculate from each one of these bootstrap samples, the statistics, those have nothing to do with our confidence level. Once you build your distribution, your confidence level is about where do I draw those vertical lines? And that's going to be at the last statement where we're finding the quantile. So if I had a 90% confidence interval, so the middle 90%, I would be changing those values at the ends to chop off 5% from each end. So that would be the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. Or if I was looking at 99% confidence interval, I'd want to chop off half a percent from one end and half a percent from the other. So to recap, your sample statistic from your observed sample is not your population parameter. But if your sample is good, it can be a good estimate. And by good, we mean representative. We report the estimate with a confidence interval, and the width of this interval depends on the variability of sample statistics from different samples of the population. And since we can't continue sampling from the population, if we could, we'd just get a bigger sample, we bootstrap from the one sample we have to estimate the sampling variability. So we try to simulate how we would expect the samples to vary from one to another. 
For the mean, uh, we said at the end, once you get your bootstrap samples, you can calculate the statistic to be mean. Uh, for the median, you can do median. And if you look at the help for the uh, that calculate function, you'll see that there are other options you can provide to the function as well. And we're going to learn about calculating other bootstrap intervals uh, for different statistics. We've only done the mean here um, in your last homework for the course.